Hello world, we've been led to believe that our phones are pretty secure, that all of our data is securely encrypted, and that only by unlocking your phone can you access your data. Though, as new research has shown, this isn't quite the case. In reality, law enforcement often has tools to bypass your phone's encryption. But how do they do it, and how can you derail any efforts to decrypt your device with one simple trick? That and more in this week's episode. Researchers at John Hopkins University decided to investigate the encryption mechanisms that Android and iOS devices use. If you use one of those, which you probably do, then this video might be a little grim. Upon starting their investigation, the researchers initially presumed that phones do a pretty decent job of protecting data. But one of the cryptographers involved in the research concluded with saying, so why do we need a backdoor for law enforcement when the protections that these phones actually offer are so bad? So, so let's break down their findings. When you lock your phone with a password, face ID, fingerprint, whatever tickles your pickle, the entire contents of your phone are encrypted. Even if someone was to steal your device and manage to pull all of the data off of it, all they'd be able to see is gibberish. Kind of like if you opened a zip file in Notepad gibberish. In order to unlock an iPhone's 256-bit AES encryption, an attacker would require a key that only generates when you unlock your phone with a passcode, face ID, or whatever. Taking this into account, it should be pretty difficult for an unauthorized party to grab your data, or at least that's what the researchers thought. Let's take an iPhone for example. When an iPhone is off, completely off, and you turn it on, all the data is in a state Apple calls complete protection. You need to unlock the device with the passcode before you can do pretty much anything. Even if someone calls you when your phone is in this state, caller ID just doesn't work, because your phone simply cannot decrypt your address book, so instead you just see the raw phone number even if the caller is in your contacts. However, when you unlock your phone after a restart, a lot of your data moves into a state called after first unlock. Your phone is still in this state even if you proceed to lock the phone again. The only way to reach complete protection is to restart your device. And I don't know about you, but I can't remember the last time I actually turned off my phone. So what does this mean in practice? And what does it mean to be in the after first unlock state? Well, when your phone is in the complete protection state, the encryption keys to unlock your data are stored deep within the OS itself and are encrypted themselves. However, once your phone is in the after first unlock state, these keys are stored in RAM. If an attacker could exploit certain types of vulnerabilities, they'd be able to grab these keys that are stored in RAM and decrypt your data. But Satonic, an attack like that sounds pretty difficult, right? What's the chance an attacker is going to have the technical knowledge to pull something like this off? Well, you see, they don't need to. Tools already exist that can help you do just this. Celebrite is a company which sells one such tool, which can grab data on locked iOS devices all the way up to iOS 13. And by the way, we're only on iOS 14 right now, so there are going to be a hell of a lot of devices using an outdated version, about a third, according to Wikipedia. It's impossible for us to know exactly how Celebrite do this, though the researchers figure an attack which exploits this vulnerability is likely how almost all smartphone access tools work right now. Now. And for all you Android people furiously typing away in the comments, ha 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 ha, that's what you get when you buy an iPhone. Well, you're in the same boat. Because the researchers found that Android works in almost the exact same way and has the exact same vulnerability. In fact, Android is actually slightly worse in that Apple provides an option for developers to keep some data under complete protection all the time, something a banking app might use for example. Android simply doesn't have an option for this. In addition, because there's so many different Android phones out there, there are way more versions to defend, and Android users are much less likely to be using the latest up-to-date versions of their operating system, which increases the chances they're using an older OS, which has those pesky security holes. And don't forget, the latest mobile OSs may have vulnerabilities hidden in them that haven't yet been disclosed, so it isn't even certain that just by staying up to date that you are, in fact, safe and sound. Apple and Google were of course confronted over these findings. Apple said, the company's security work is focused on protecting users from hackers, thieves, and criminals looking to steal personal information. And I suppose they've got a point with this. Some guy grabbing your phone and yeeting off with it likely isn't going to possess the intellectual prowess to exfiltrate your encryption keys from RAM. 
In fact, if I was a phone thief, which I am not, just to avoid confusion, the first thing I'd do is turn off your phone to stop you from tracking it, which would of course render this whole vulnerability useless. After all, a phone thief is likely going to be selling your phone for scraps. But we're talking about law enforcement here, which has access to MDFTs, that's mobile device forensic tools, which includes, as mentioned, that Celebrite software. According to Wired, law enforcement in all 50 states have contracts with vendors like Celebrate. Between 2015 and 2019, Upturn, which is a non-profit research company, found almost 50,000 instances of police using MDFT software. In the USA, for police to unlock your phone using these tools, they do need a warrant, though they can request these warrants for offences from suspected murder all the way down to shoplifting. Also, these warrants don't actually limit what the police can look for on a phone, and allow police to use anything on the phone against a suspect. For petty crimes, giving police potentially unfettered access to all the data on a phone seems somewhat unreasonable when you take into account just how much personal data and the variety of personal data that's stored on your phone. To make matters worse, Upturn found that the data extracted from phones is rarely deleted. So what's going to be done about this security blunder? Apple and Google's responses were remarkably tame. Apple said their goal with iOS is to balance security and convenience. So this leads me to believe that we aren't really going to see much in the way of a radical change in this particular instance. After all, it may even be in most people's interest to leave this security hole lingering. Sounds odd, but hear me out on this one. Many governments in the Western world have been toying with the idea of making laws against the use of encryption by tech companies. Sounds crazy, I know. But given this particular vulnerability seems to only be of widespread use by law enforcement, fixing it would only serve to piss off law enforcement agencies, which would only serve to further bolster the anti-encryption lobby, give them something more to hark on about. By leaving this vulnerability as is, it's effectively throwing a bone to governments. And if it stops them from coming after encryption as a whole, then it may be somewhat of a compromise. Sure, preferably I would like to see this whole fixed, but if it comes at the expense of pushing the anti-encryption politicians over the Rubicon and coming for encryption and privacy on a grander scale, then maybe not. Before you continue watching, I want you to pause and go and leave a comment. What do you think? Should we try to keep the anti-encryption advocates at bay by throwing them a few bones, or would you rather bite the bullet and go after full, no compromises privacy? Whilst you're down there, you might as well like the video for the YouTube AI and subscribe for more content like this. And do turn on notifications. I want to try to be quick to cover breaking security related news in the future. The only way to stay up to date is via those notifications. I suppose the takeaway from all of this is, if some baddies are coming to steal your data, then just turn off your phone, and for good measure, might as well burn off your fingerprints while you're at it. If you're using Face ID, well, then there's not much you can do, unless you want to get real drastic, but let's not go there. Maltronics.com is where you can find the sweetest selection of pen testing products. Run by myself, our latest release is the Malduino W, which is a bad USB, but with Wi-Fi. Learn more about the Malduino W and all of our other products over at Maltronics.com and get 10% off with discount code SATONIC. In other news, those dreaded changes to the WhatsApp privacy policy that I talked about in my previous video are apparently not going to come into force for another few months, until May 15th to be precise. WhatsApp released a statement referencing that there's been a lot of misinformation causing concern regarding the new privacy policy changes. And sure, I have seen some articles on the interwebs purporting that WhatsApp is going to be able to read the contents of messages, something that just isn't the case. WhatsApp released this infographic to help clarify the changes, though what's notable is what's missing from it, i.e. all of that talk about that juicy metadata that's going to be siphoned off to Facebook. Now it's time for mildly interesting things I found on the internet this week, or Mittyfotty for short. In Raspberry Pi news, the Pi Foundation came out yesterday with an all-new Pi. It's called the Pi Pico, and I've ordered three of the things. 
Though this new release isn't just any old Pi. We've had the Raspberry Pi 1, 2, 3 and 4, and of course the Pi Zero, which is essentially just a semi-skimmed version of the full fat Pi. Though the Raspberry Pi Pico is a microcontroller board, so it doesn't run Raspberry Pi's flavor of Linux, Pi OS. Instead, you can think of the Pi Pico as a competitor to Arduino or ESP-based boards. It doesn't have the raw processing power to run a fully-fledged OS, but you can use it to control small displays, motion sensors, buzzers, LEDs, etc, etc. And it does feel kind of weird to call a device like this a Pi, given it can't run Linux. Though it'll be interesting to see where this goes, because the Pi Foundation is super reputable and has some serious resources to throw at this thing. There's tons of documentation on the Pi Pico, and you can order one today for less than 4 quid. Moving on, a vulnerability found in YouTube allowed anyone to view private videos. The full explanation is a little detailed, though you can find a link to the write-up by my mate David in the description. Though essentially, the bug allowed you to grab a thumbnail of a private video at a specific time, if you had its YouTube ID. By simply cycling through and grabbing a bunch of thumbnails for all of the video's frames, you could assemble a GIF of the video. Now, of course, a GIF compiled with thumbnails is pretty low resolution, and there would be no no audio, though if you set a video private, you would expect it to be, well, private. For finding and reporting the bugs Google, David copped a 5k reward. Not bad. So that's all for this week. If you want to see what goes on behind the scenes of my YouTube channel and my company Maltronics, make sure to follow me on Instagram. I'm at John T. As always, stay tuned for more hacking videos and have a good one.